Okay, we, we've, only got, um, we've only got one hour for this session, so let's, if, if people could come in, if you're coming in, and depart if you're departing, so we can close the door. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Duncan Hollis. I'm a professor of law at Temple University in Philadelphia and a non-resident fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm joined up here on the dais today uh, by Madeline Carr, who is an associate professor in international relations and cybersecurity at University College London. And if that's not interdisciplinary enough, she works within an engineering faculty. Um, we're sad that our lodestar, uh, Pablo Hinosa of uh, AP NIC, could not join us. Uh, he had to return to Australia uh, sooner than expected. Um, Pablo was the inspiration uh, for today's roundtable, um, so we hope we can live up to his uh, vision uh, today. Uh, Pablo, Madeline, and I are pleased to have spent the last three IGF working to bridge internet governance conversations uh, to include new groups and issues. So three years ago, we began by bringing what's known as the UNGGE process, the Group of Governmental Experts process, dialoguing on cybersecurity, bringing that into the Internet's governance community um, as the two processes were largely delinked. And you can see, I think, some products of that in President Macron's uh, efforts to bring uh, his Paris call not to the Paris Peace Forum, but to the IGF. Um, last year, we sought to bring the CERT community uh, computer emergency response team community more into the dialogue both with the IGF and that cybersecurity dialogue um, asking if search should engage in science diplomacy. This year we're coming home to a familiar and pressing issue the who is database or maybe I should say databases um, which has been the subject of so much attention given the impact on its operations by the recent implementation of GDPR. Once again, though, we're trying to bring in some new voices to the conversation, um, again, seeking to join the Internet governance community with those from the CERT and law enforcement communities. And in doing so, our larger goal is to frame this discourse around a, a single concept, and that is accountability. Um, usually, when we talk about who is or GDPR, it quickly devolves into a, co a conversation between privacy and security. And I do not want to diminish either of those. They're both important values, uh, and, um, and, and the tension between them is well known and not limited to the Internet governance context. But rather than juxtaposing these values, we wanted to ask more about accountability and to think to what extent do actors online need to be accountable. And when I say actors, I do not just mean ICANN or the regional Internet registries or even just the third-party users who seek access to WHOIS databases, but including all users, that is, even those who are being asked to input uh, their information into these databases. And in an ideal world, uh, in the next 56 minutes, we'd emerge from today's discussion with a better sense of what accountability means to different stakeholder groups, how much overlap there is in that concept among those groups, and also where the divergences or blockages lie. So how are we going to do this? Um, if you've been with us the last two years, you know uh, Pablo inspired us to not do the traditional panel format, uh, but to have an integrated and iterated discussion. So think of it kind of like speed dating, short, direct interventions from our speakers interspersed with questions and comments from the floor, which I should add, um, are going to be equally short. We are going to, in the interest of time, ask all interventions from the floor to not exceed two minutes. I'm a law professor. I'm used to cutting off uh, people. I will do so vociferously today. Um, so to get us started, I, I should um, maybe we'll do a very brief introduction of some of the speakers. I'll, I'll turn to um, Madeline. Maybe you can make some introductions. Yeah, sure. Um, so. As, as uh, Duncan said, uh, we, we didn't want to do the kind of panel presentations and, and then accept a few uh, uh, questions from the floor, particularly given the, the short time that we have today. So we, our, our panelists are, are, are really um, sitting in amongst you, and that's kind of indicative of, of the conversation that we want to have. So just, just to let you know who's here, uh, to Duncan's right, we have Paul Wilson, who's the head of APNIC, the, the regional internet registry at, for the Asia Pacific. Um, over uh, on, on my right, on your left, we have Christine Hopers, 
who is the uh, general manager. Christine, thank you. For, raise your hand. Um, general manager for the Brazil CERT. So she's going to talk today about the pers perspective of the CERTs and, and, and their engagement and, and use of who is databases. Um, we also have Greg Monnier, who's down here in the front. And Greg uh, is uh, um, head of outreach for, the, for Europol. Um, and so he's got this kind of law enforcement perspective that we wanted to bring in as well. Down here we've got Becky Burr, who is Deputy General Counsel and Chief Privacy Officer for Newstar, and she's also an ICANN board member. Um, we've got uh, Farsi Badi down, down here in the front row, Farsi, who's um, a uh, academic at Georgia Tech University and um, will introduce a kind of uh, human rights uh, perspective, which is, is so fundamental to these debates. And that is our lineup. Duncan? Great. Proceed. So in terms of the framework for the discussion, I think we're looking to loosely break it into three parts. So part one, um, maybe level the playing field a bit to get a sense of what is, who is, who uses it, what are the different stakeholders that are interested in this dialogue. Part two, maybe talk about why who is is important or why different stakeholders think it's important. What's the purpose? And that purpose might then help us inform what do people think of when they think about accountability. Uh, and part three, uh, a look ahead, moving forward, what's the status of this issue at ICANN, uh, including the role of the expedited policy development program, the universal access, as well as the role of the CERT community and the law enforcement community, and even the role of the IGL, GF itself in, in moving us forward. Um, ideally, I'd like, uh, I, I'd like to alert all of the, the speakers that I'm going to come back to you. At the last five minutes, we maybe do a tour to horizon and ask everyone for a single takeaway. And that takeaway can be in the form of a question that you think needs to be answered for us to move this debate forward, or maybe a position that you think, if there could be some consensus built around, might move us to bridge what is currently a, 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 both a, a pressing and, and, sadly, I think, a deep divide. Um, but before I do that, or well before I do that, I thought I, I was going to, part of the reason Paul's up here is we wanted him to start us off. Um, so Paul, I'm wondering if you could just briefly um, kind of situate the room. I know a lot of people know about who is, and I assume there are many who use it, but can you talk just briefly about what is who is, what, what, is it, what does it mean, or, or maybe what are who is, if you think of it as multiple things? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to use a very simple analogy. Um, I come from APNIC. We're a regional internet registry, and the second R in RIR stands for registry. That's, that's what we are. And the word registry is used across, um, across the internet community with respect to, to critical internet resources very often, but it's also a very common uh, English word. And the definition of a registry is a place where, regis where registers or records are, are kept. And we all know about, say, a land, a land titles registry where land as a public resource uh, is administered in a given geography by a registry. And if, uh, if any member of the public wants to know who is the holder of a particular block of land, then they go to the registry and they find out. So internet resources are kind of like uh, land geographic resources in that sense. And we've got several different sets. We've got, uh, in the technical identifier space, we've got don domain names and we've got numbers. Both of those considered to be public resources. And both of those therefore requiring, because they are, they are allocated or assigned to people, they require registries to, in order that members of the public can again find out who is the, the registered holder of a given resource. So the registries that we see in the names world are the, the global generic top level domain registries, the .com and the .info and the, the 2000 more that have been created recently. There are the CCTLD country code registries, which are separate registries for each of the two letter country codes. So across, even across the names, we've got thousands of registries. These are actually independently operated. So they're operated according to a standard but each of the registries for each of those, each of the registry organizations for each of those sets of resources really is an independent body. They don't, they don't have to adhere to, the same, to, the, to exactly the same standards. And in fact, many of them have got their own reasons for doing things in a particular way. The same thing goes for internet numbers. We've got one single global pool of internet numbers. In, we've got one pool for IPv4, we've got one pool for IP version 6. That actually, the, the IPv4 resource was administered centrally by a single registry up until the early 1990s when it became 
clear that that registration function was, was, uh, was becoming very heavy weight and difficult and it was decided by, by the communities that the registry should be split into five, that there should be regional internet registries. So these days we've got five separate number registries as determined by the internet community a long time ago uh, in each of those five ge geographically separate regions. So each of the RIRs, the regional internet registries, operate a registry for the resources in our ge geographic region that we manage. And so a member of the public who wants to know what is going on or who happens to have a particular IP address can go to the appropriate registry and find out who's got that. And that's, I mean, I guess we'll hear how, how important that is. The point I'm making, I guess, is that we've got a bunch of separate resources being registered in a bunch of separate geographies, but the registration process is the responsible responsibility of a registry in each case and there are, so there are these thousands of registries that operate independently. The point of who is is who is is a generic term for a very simple protocol which is for the registry itself. So each of those registries, although they can be implemented and managed in different ways, they're generally regarded as who is databases because who is is the original uh, Unix uh, line command that used to give you uh, the answer from the particular registry that you were inquiring. So I suppose that's that's where we are. I, I regard that all as, as fairly simple, but it, there's sort of some basics there in terms of what we're doing and why, which I think is useful to uh, to sort of start from. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. I mean, I, yeah, I think one of the things I, I take away from that is, among other things, is that as I, I think as we proceed in our conversation is when we talk about who is, we're not talking about a monolithic unitary function or database, we're talking about multiple databases that serve maybe multiple functions. And generally being run independently with a, with a, an, a, a, a voluntary collaboration amongst them because of course that's, that's useful as well, but they are under independent authorities. Right, so I think that's quite useful. Um, I'm wondering um, maybe next if we could, if I could invite um, Chris um, for you to weigh in, coming from, from Brazil and coming from uh, the Brazil CERT, could you maybe for the audience talk a little bit about what, you know, I think many but not all will know what a CERT is, so what functions does the Brazil CERT uh, uh, serve, um, and then what is who is, what does it mean to you, and I suspect some in the room may also be a third, if I can ask you three questions at once, um, what's the role of GDPR, or how's, how has it in the last few months, if at all, impacted um, your operations? But Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, talking about what is a mission and what's a cert, uh, I don't know if everyone is, is acquainted with the work that preceded the Best Practices Forum for Cybersecurity. We had in the 2013-2014 uh, period and 2014-15 period, uh, a best practices forum on establishing and supporting CSERTs. And we have two reports on the IGF intersessional work that describe what CSERTs are, what's the importance. And uh, I think the, the best definition that came from the 2015 report was really that a CSERT is a team of experts that responds to computer security incidents, coordinates the resolution, notifies its constituents, exchanges information with others, and assists constituents with the mitigation of the incident. So it's, th this I'm reading straight from the report for the IGF 2015. And I think it's uh, very important to see that we are talking about technical coordination and that we are talking about helping networks and about helping people to resolve issues. So uh, even when, when we as a technical community, a CERT community, talk about investigating things, we are talking more about in the researching and about in discovering what happened and how to prevent. So we see that that is a common word that has some misconceptions and, and people, uh, we use it very naively when we say that we are investigating an incident but really we want to know who was affected, why they were affected and how we can recover. So I think this is what really is important. So CERT VR is, a CERT, is more a CERT of last resort. We are one of two national CERTs in Brazil and we work into helping uh, the community in Brazil to identify, detect and solve incidents. So uh, we do some uh, different uses of who is, but the most important one for us is really to identify 
who owns a given network and owns in the sense that who is the administrator or who is responsible for abuse. And uh, for us, it's really important the IP who is database and the autonomous system who is databases because then we can find uh, who is the person that we can contact that can actually solve a problem, can actually clean an infected machine or could recover from a compromise. And uh, I'm, I'm going to use some examples to explain how who is is important because I think that uh, just saying that it's important to solve issues maybe doesn't make clear how do we use it. So in the recent past, um, we had a, a, an event that happened this year that was uh, all over the media and Wired and ZDNet and everyone talking that we had uh, from 150,000 to 200,000 routers in Brazil that were compromised by a crypto jacking um, malware. So they were actually MikroTik routers. They were there doing routing as it was supposed to do, but they managed to compromise because of a vulnerability. And they were doing quant hive crypto mining and stealing resources and uh, stealing resources from the users of that. So we had some research organizations that passed to us uh, those IPs and we needed to use the WHOIS database to find out who were the network owners and how could we reach to them and say to them that they were compromised and, and how to recover. And in Brazil, we have um, more than 5,000 ISPs and we have a very broad ecosystem. So it's really WHOIS is important. Uh, but it's not only important for national teams. We also have like small or big organizations that need access to WHOIS to quickly find uh, their peers in another networks and to be able to um, exchange information and help to solve an incident. For example, uh, we see a lot of organizations that are under the DOS attacks using amplification. They need to identify who are the owner of the misconfigured networks that are amplifying the network. So the quickest way was not to go through hoops and try to find national teams and other teams. It's really to go to who is and find who is the contact in that organization and tell them you have a misconfigured DNS or NTP or something and could you solve the problem and stop the attack. And we also have some other cases that affect like routing problems. So when we have a routing problem on the internet, we need to find who is the contact for the other network. So uh, although people talk about BGP hijacking in a sense of organized crime, setting up their own autonomous systems or something like that, what we are seeing in Brazil is really small networks having the routers compromised and setting up routing. So you need to find quickly who they are. And I would say that if certs and, and parts of other parts of the security community cannot have access to who is anymore, this will practically impede us from working. So our work starts with a who is query. And our work starts with finding out who is the responsible for the other network for us to try to solve problems. And we use that data not to track or to find out who did what, but who can help us to solve the problem and to mitigate the effects uh, of everything from data leaks to other problems. And uh, I think this is more or less how we use data and why it is so important for, for CSERTs, for CERTs to have access to who is data. And this is our daily work. Even when we deliver training, we have special sessions on how to find contact information on who is because that determines uh, really the course of action from, from going forward. So I think this sums up what I had to, to say for now. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. So we, we're going to um, actually open up to the floor now because we, I think what, what's been brought out here is this kind of tension, right, that, that as Paul uh, has explained, we have these registers, we have always had them, and Christine has just explained how this network of, of, um, of security professionals globally rely on them for their work on a day-to-day -day basis. But of course, these databases have personally identifiable information in them, and that's the kind of information that we're not meant to be sharing uh, without legitimate cause under GDPR. So there's this, this I immediate tension. So let's open up to, to comments from the floor before we move on to our next intervention. Anybody w want to inject at this stage? No? 
Oh, one, one in, the, in the back here. Can you just use the mic, though, please, for the remote participation? Yeah, um, hello, my name's Alan Barrett. I'm from AfriNIC, another RIR. Um, you. You're talking about personal information in the WHOIS database. Um, I think we, it's useful to draw a distinction between the DNS WHOIS and the um, IP numbers WHOIS databases because there's really very much less personal information in the um, RIR WHOIS databases. Most of our IP addresses are registered to companies and organizations, not really to individuals. No, that's a good point. But of course, sometimes company information can uh, reveal personal information, personally identifiable information. So it's still something that people need to be very mindful of. We were having this conversation at dinner last night and, and, and talking about these issues of accountability and, and uh, and, and remembering, for those of us old enough to remember, that there, there did used to be this book uh, with everybody's name, address, and phone number in it that was distributed for free to all of our houses. Um, and, and that was the phone book. And, and, it, and we just, ex it was the registry. <laughs> and, we <laughs> and we were perfectly comfortable with that. But as Duncan pointed out, there's this kind of you know, um, uh, shift in, in the way we perceive these things. And of course, it couldn't be exploited in the same way that, that, that on these online uh, information sources could be. But, but it does kind of show this, this change in approaches to this. We have another question in the back. Could you Thanks. identify yourself too, please? Hello, my name is Jon Erbgut. I'm um, researching at University of Geneva. And uh, I'm working in um, data protection and blockchain. And uh, I was wondering, uh, isn't the problem due to the fact that uh, ICANN rules have no legal status? So if we have a law or a convention um, that will um, describe the ICANN rules, uh, wouldn't uh, GDPR would respect it. But it's just like Facebook asking you something and you have to comply. Uh, ICANN rules have no legal status. And since there is no legal status, there is no respect from other laws towards uh, those rules. And ca uh, couldn't we maybe reach something that will establish a legal status for ICANN rules so that other laws like GDPR will respect it? Thank you. So it's, it's, a, it's a great question, um, and I think it, it highlights how, as somebody who studies international law and inter international relations, ICANN as a multi-stakeholder institution is not necessarily what lawyers would call sui generis, but definitely in, in a minority of regulatory global governance regimes, although I actually think the, the, the shift is towards more multi-stakeholder and less treaty multilateral solutions. I mean, I, I do think, of course, ICANN is incorporated in California. It is a, it is a company, and it does engage not in lawmaking, but in lawful activity, right? It engages in contracts uh, uh, and the like. So there is, there is a legal force to, to entering into deals with, with, with ICANN. But I, we have an ICANN board member here who might be um, a, able to maybe speak a little bit about how, from their perspective, uh, you know, what sort of response to that sort of a challenge they, they think about it. So Becky, maybe give the floor to you. So thank you, and let me just, I just want to broaden this up a little bit. Um, GDPR is one uh, data protection law. There are data protection laws all over the world um, that apply. Um, California is, uh, uh, has adopted a, a uh, data protection law um, that would essentially uh, act as the, the, um, the standard in the United States um, as well. So. My first comment is, let's take it a little bit more broadly. It is true that in the GDPR, um, uh, you have to have a lawful basis for processing the data, and one of the lawful processes for, for um, processing data uh, is the public interest. But under GDPR, um, that public interest is typically needs to be laid down in European law or EU member state law. Um, ICANN uh, is charged by, uh, as its bylaws, by operating in the public interest, um, but we do not have the authority to create a public interest standard under GDPR. Uh, so it is one approach to this 
um, would be to, uh, and one approach to getting a consistent experience for users would be to recognize ICANN's authority um, uh, uh, to develop um, uh, standards in the public interest. Um, that is not to say, though, that that, uh, that would completely uh, eliminate the issue. You still have to um, address uh, the, you, ha you still have to uh, process data um, legally and respectfully. Um, and so the devil is in the details in terms of the standards. Thank you, Becky. Do we have any further comments from the floor at this point? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter van Roste. I'm the uh, general manager of Center European CCTLDs. Uh, I just want to add two, uh, two elements to the debate. First, on, on the 25th of May, um, there, there was no major change in the European CCTLD landscape. I cannot talk about other TLDs. But this, this has been an, an evolution over the last decade. If you look at countries like .pe or .eu, um, there who is already looked quite different last year compared to, uh, to 2005. Um, so and it would be interesting to hear from certs or law enforcement in the room if on their side they actually uh, felt even the change between the 20th and the 28th of May. So that would be interesting. Um, the second point that I want to make, and it relates to something Becky mentioned, that um, it is not just about showing data in the who is, it's about processing data. Um, from what I can see on the collection side um, of that process, few things have changed. There, is, there are some discussions, some very public in Germany, on uh, the data minimization, but in general, CCTLD still collect the information as they've been doing for the last decades. Um, the difference is that since it, about 10 years, as I mentioned earlier, um, they're showing less publicly, but that information is still available. We did a survey amongst our members. We have 54 members, uh, CCTLDs. 75% um, of them has a uh, non-automated process, typically via email, where um, law enforcement can uh, identify themselves, and certs, by the way, can identify themselves, uh, show their credentials, and request specific data. Uh, and that seems to work. Um, the number of requests are actually much uh, lower than one would expect uh, for one of the largest global CCTLDs. This is a handful of requests per week. And so the non-automated process seems to work quite well for CCTLDs. Thank you for those comments. That's really helpful in it. And it, in a sense, is a good segue to, um, to, to Greg's comments. I mean, Greg, that, that question from, from the floor about have you seen a change in, in the efficacy of your, of your practice in law enforcement as a consequence, or has it been uh, business as usual? Thank you. Um, before I answer um, uh, Peter's question, I think it's important from the outset to say that from the law enforcement perspective, we think that the who is information um, is really an essential element of accountability and transparency online. I think it's, um, we have to understand that this is on one of the only places on the internet where you can find information on somebody or a company who is registering a, a domain. And I think it's, um, from the outset, it's really important to, to keep that in mind. And I, I relate to what Paul was saying and the, the, the comparison to the land registry, that's very important. Um, from the law enforcement perspective, we use registration information um, of domains a little bit in a similar way to the third community. The only difference is that our business is about um, attribution of criminal activities. So we don't do much preventions, but we're really trying to find out after a crime has taken place online who was involved and who did it, basically. And the who is is not the silver bullet, of course. Uh, you won't find your key evidence in the who is information, but you will be able to find indicators, pointers, um, patterns of registrations that will lead you to identify potentially somebody or an organization, a uh, criminal organization was behind um, uh, the crime. To give you a concrete example, for instance, if you're investigating um, a, a botnet that has been created by a malware, that has been circulated by a spamming campaign, very often you will find that one domain was involved in this um, uh, uh, distribution of spam, and then you need to f be able to very quickly find information as to who has registered that domain, when, and obviously as a criminal you're not going to give your legitimate identity, you will probably use uh, stolen identity or maybe just make it up. But at the end, there will always be 
um, a, a piece of information that has been used and reused for other domains. So I think this is uh, important to, to, to explain how we're using it. Um, um, typically, if you, if you investigate a big domain that is based or a criminal infrastructure, online infrastructure that is based on domains, you will have to make um, thousands of lookup per week. And so it's very important for the law enforcement community and for the CSET community and all those that are involved in cybersecurity to be able to have direct access, like timely access, very quickly to that information. You can't rely on MLAT, for instance, to request to a registrar, which is based in the US, information on registrants, which might anyway be wrong, um, and then wait nine months or three months to get back information. So you need to be able to do check really um, uh, quickly. Um, now to answer the questions of, of, of Peter, yes, we, we do, we have felt um, uh, the, the, the impact of uh, GDPR on the 20th of May and, and, and the change in the um, contract with the contracted parties from, from ICANN uh, um, and the reductions of uh, personal information in the WIS database. Um, to give you an example, um, uh, I mean, typically criminals will register domains in bulk, so they will make use of if suddenly a registrar is making a, a, a special offer, then they will register a lot, of a lot of domain very cheaply. And then they will use them depending on the criminal activities at, at, um, on, on, on space. So um, uh, there is a, a time gap for sure in terms of um, we don't know what we don't know. So some of the investigations we are conducting now, we still find the information because domains have been registered be between the, before the 25th of May. But some of the investigations we're doing now, we don't know that we're missing links and leads because we don't know that we're missing the information. Because when you've checked for a specific domains, you don't find the information and you don't find the pointers and you can't pivot to, f to see how many other domains have been, have been registered. So it's, currently it's difficult to document the impact. We do have a number of investigations, in particular in the field of um, um, intellectual property that are coming up now, and I know that we have a big operation at the end of November, and we know that we do it regularly and that the result will be much less successful compared to six months ago because we don't have access to that information. Thank you, Greg. I, I wonder, just, uh, I, I wanna bring in a couple of other speakers, but before I do, given the question, Chris, it might be good to come back to you and ask the same question from the CERT perspective. Have you, particularly from Brazil, seen uh, an impact on your work as a result of, of uh, GDPR? Uh, actually, no. And one of the things that we have been discussing through the first community is that uh, GDPR in the recital 49, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, it states that uh, CERTs are part of the legitimate interests that could have access to data. And most of the time, certs were already protecting data, anonymizing data when they share data. So for example, we share data all anonymized. So we have projects already sharing information with teams in Europe, and that didn't change because it was always core to our work to actually uh, protect information and try to not expose victims and try to anonymize information. I know that uh, from what we saw from last year's, uh, from this year's uh, National Sea Search meeting, we have, I think European teams have a little bit more work with uh, the pseudonymization of some information. Uh, in Brazil, we have our data protection law that was pretty much based on GDPR coming into effect in 2020. So, but there, uh, even from the people that wrote the law and the first people that are actually trying to create uh, what would be the, the legal uh, basis for working, they say that certs are part of the legitimate interest of the citizen to have certs to be able to handle this information because we are the ones that are detecting data leaks, that are detecting compromises, malware, and, and we could help them. So uh, I think it's, it's really more uh, this discussion of uh, the DPR and, and I can wish that was the, the murky thing, but more for with the IRRs that's working in the same way and the understanding that this is corporate data and that certs need to have some access to that information. So I think it's not really that it changed and especially in the projects we have together with European certs, nothing changed so far. So, but because we already were protecting and anonymizing a lot of the information. Thank you. Um, so we've, uh, we've left uh, our, one of our last speakers out for now, but I think it's a super important voice. So Farsi, I'm, I'm wondering if you could weigh in from the, 
from the human rights perspective, particularly with an eye to this question of accountability and, and where where does accountability lie in this debate? You know, and and who should be accountable for what? And and particularly from the human rights perspective, because I think that's that's we, we've had. I think we've heard from the cert side, from the law enforcement side, their interest, and a bit about how it's perceived from the you know from the ICANN perspective. But where? What about those whose personally identifiable information might be at stake or other human rights interests that you see at play here? Thank you. Barzani speaking. Um, so when we talk about who is, we should be clear that who is holds personal, sensitive information of people, not only cyber criminals, not only abusers, but people. Who is being compared to traditional registries is I believe wrong, and I respectfully suggest that we do not do such analogies. This registry is global. Access to such registry, you can uh, have access to personal sensitive information of people globally. So the uh, information should be safeguarded, but of course the law enforcement answer to, does to do a great job and a very important job which is to uh, provide security in cyberspace. And that is very important. However, the data and the sensitive information of people should not be abused. It should not be mined. So there should be safeguards for that. The data users, we always talk about access to who is. But we never, we, we need to also address uh, the question of what, who is accessing what information. It's your fax number, it's your phone number, it's your email address, it's your physical address, it's your residential address. These are the elements that uh, they're accessing. So who are these people who are accessing the information? So, so, and how should, who has legitimate interest to have access? These are the questions that we need to, uh, to respond to because our rights are at at stake, our human rights, the advocates that have websites and, and uh, you know, all sorts of human rights uh, issues can be at stake. Now, you can ask me, so do you know if anyone has been killed because of uh, access to their, who is, no, I cannot give you that uh, example. But the possibility, when it is out there, we should not allow that, we should, we should prevent it. And then, also we need to provide due process uh, to people, to the registrants. If you have access to their data and you want to uh, bring legal action to it, they should be, the, the mere access to that data should not deprive them from due process. They should be able to provide, uh, to defend themselves. And that's about it, thank you. So I, I, th I think it's, that's an important voice to be heard. I guess um, in terms of accountability, far as I'm gonna, turn and ask you a question if I might. In terms of the personal information you describe, do, do I infer from that though that there is an obligation on individual residents to provide that information? I mean, it, you know, when we think about accountability, I think there's this fundamental question of, well, how much uh, information should you provide when you're, you're, you're you know, putting into these databases in the sense that then if there's a law enforcement need or a cert need or some other need that you can rely on the accuracy of that information or even if you can't rely on its accuracy you might find patterns that would do so. Because it seems to me there's a larger question here of you know do, do, does society, global society or different stakeholder groups have a right to know who has you know uh, um, registered certain things. So I, I, I'm, and I, that's a question actually for all uh, I think the speakers, and, and maybe we'll then turn it over to the floor as well, because I think that's, a, and we think about accountability, that's, that's one where I wonder, um, it, you know, if we step up to 30,000 foot, what people think. But I'll start, if, if I may, as far as. So, maybe uh, I can, um, so, you're asking whether a domain name registrant, if like, uh, for example, um, I have like a family a domain name, if I'm like accountable, if that a domain name gets, uh, abused or uh, like used for uh, criminal activities. So whether I am, I think that no, I think we need to have measures 
uh, in place that without accessing personal information of people, we can mitigate this. Uh, mit we can mit mitigate DNS abuse. We can uh, mitigate cyber abuse. The problem is that who is is a 30-year-old protocol. I think it was in place when internet was not scaled so uh, so much. It is old. It needs to be. We are in an uh, innovation. We are like an innovative community. We need to come up with uh, mechanisms that, as well as respecting rights, it also brings security and uh, and holds people holds do those who are um, using it accountable in an easy manner. I mean, it's not. I uh, know I'm talking about a utopia, probably, but seriously, it's not that hard. We need to work on that and uh, be a little bit rights respecting. Thank you very much, Farsana. Um, I, I want to bring in two um, other people, but just quickly, uh, Jack Kim. Is it Kim? Jack Kim? Jack Key, I'm sorry, who works for APC. And, and uh, we were hoping that, that Jack would show up. She just came in a little bit later uh, and works specifically on, on human rights and particularly in the context of gender, uh, I believe. Jack, you probably have some, some comments to make on this, but could I just flag also that when we return in this last five minutes, that maybe, Farzana, if you could be, you know, be prepared to articulate, what would you propose? So we have that very clear uh, statement from you. Um, Jack? Thanks. Um, I have to run, so I just wanted to quickly ch jump in. Um, I think that this is a really interesting conversation and thank you very much for also unpacking how certs are using who is. I think I entered into this not being very clear. And in my mind I was thinking, when have I used who is? And I have, yeah? And primarily, the, so the work that I do is also focusing on online gender-based violence. I also work with LGBTQ um, communities. So you can imagine that it's sort of two sides of the coin, right? Um, and I've used who is primarily when I'm trying to find out, well, who's the dick who's doing something? Um, and I'm I use who is because I'm also an early adopter of technology. So I think I want to bring in a few, maybe two or three points. The first point is that I just came from several sessions yesterday. One was around mental health and teenage suicides and social media. And um, one was around disinformation and so forth. And the key takeaway from those sessions is that anonymity is critical for safety. And anonymity is critical for safety, particularly for groups of people who are very vulnerable and who, are, who do not have as much privilege or access to particular kinds of things. And I say this in relation to my own experience also is because for many of our partners whom we work with or who experience online gender-based violence, they have no clue what who is is. It's not going to help them to find out a whole bunch of things. This only who is information helps only a very specific group of people who are doing very important um, and necessary work, so for certs or law enforcement and so forth, but it's not the, the revelation of this, this information in order to defend my security at an individual level. The balance of that is off. In fact, who would be the ones who would be able to access who is and who, be, who will be able to exploit this information to further abuse is actually weighted towards the, the, the um, direction of those who are perpetrating the abuse. Because generally, they are much more technically, they are much more able to game the technology in order to be able to do what they want to do, to violate privacy. So I think that's a really important principle to bear in mind, that anonymity and privacy is critical for safety, particularly for specific groups of people. Saying that having a registry that has um, information about who owns a particular domain and so forth has its value. It has its value also in accountability. I don't think it's an either or. I think that there, it is possible to kind of build a level of privacy that's necessary as an in-between layer, right? So it doesn't become accessible to every single person to address the kind of imbalance of power at the moment, but that then it becomes accessible under particular processes taking into the comments of due process that you should be able to know when your information is being accessed, why you should provide this information, so on and so forth. And I think some of this is already in place anyway. Like for example, as an individual, you can register for a domain but not use your own address, but for a particular fee, pay for an organizational address. So GDPR maybe removes the, needs, the need for a fee, which is great, then you can access privacy at less cost, personal and individual cost to yourself. But maybe accompanying this is also a particular kind of um, conversation and discourse about why this matters, why this is important to you. And I think that piece is also missing in the conversation right now. 
Do we have, uh, I really want to bring uh, Chris back in and, and, and Becky, but do we have any comments from the floor quickly before we, yep. Good afternoon, I'm uh, Ethan Sweet, I'm a Youth IGF Fellow. Um, so I just wanted to, oh, here you go. Um, I just wanted to talk about why um, domain privacy matters to us. We, uh, we know that domain pri privacy products are used by a lot of internet users now, and that really highlights how um, who is seems to have failed a lot of them for um, in terms of accountability, the accountability of the uh, regional registries to not share their information with bad actors. I personally have been had my personal information exposed through who is to people who are not so nice many a time. So I'd like to um, sort of uh, frame this debate around what um, would an average user consider to be reasonable. So for myself, I would just say that um, as long as the internet registry is accountable to me in some way, that they will not be sharing this information with any anyone who asks for any reason, then I think that is all right. I know that we've had talk of um, due process. I think it would be nice to get there, but obviously I'm don't think we're going to get there very quickly, and I think that working out what due process online would take um, a lot of time right now. So just moving towards a more pro a more restricted system for this personal data would be a good starting point for this. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Chris. Did you want to respond to the comments? Yeah, it was it's very brief. In uh, I think. Um, it's a pity that Jack left, but I think that really we need to start thinking not this have access to all or, or access to none. And I think this is really a discussion that's not productive at all. For example, for us, we need access to email and, and organization. And, and uh, for certs, uh, depending on the incident, domain is relevant, but most of the times the IP and ISN information is more important. And I think Discussing IP, ASN information and domain information as if they were the same thing, it's also not productive because uh, I think there's much more sensitive and personal information in domains. And as people say that everyone uses, I have some domains that I use proxies because I don't want to expose my personal information in a domain name. So I think it, we need to, to discuss and to discuss not necessarily uh, no access at all or because other people besides certs could have very important need to have an email contact for a network, but not necessarily for a domain name. So it's, I think we need to discuss more what, where we should go. In a much more nuanced way. And then th that probably brings us back, Becky, you probably have some comments that you'd like to feed into how you see that evolving. Yeah, so I just wanna, I wanna take one step back and say, um, I think that uh, who is, and, and there are various who is databases. They, they come in a lot of different varieties, but they share the uh, common um, uh, functional uh, job of enabling um, stakeholders to get in touch with each other to resolve issues. Um, what the kinds of issues you needed to resolve in 1988 um, uh, uh, evolved over time and once the internet became commercial, those, uh, the kinds of issues you needed to resolve continued to grow and, and evolve. But um, I think the fundamental purpose of, uh, of these databases um, and the availability of the information in the databases is to enable um, uh, uh, impacted parties to communicate uh, and, and resolve issues um, that uh, r related to the, to the use of a domain name or the use of an um, IP address or, or the like. Um, I, I agree that the w talking about an all or nothing um, kind of situation is not useful. Um, the days of fully public uh, who is published over the internet are simply gone and even though um, GDPR does in fact specifically reference the legitimacy of use by uh, certs, uh, use of this information by certs. It actually caveats that by saying the processing of personal data to the extent strictly necessary and proportionate for the purposes of ensuring network and information security. So the question is, what is the extent strictly necessary and proportionate for the purposes? And those are the questions that we are asking um, through, the, through the process here. What information do you need? Um, uh, what do you need it for? What are the circumstances 
um, under which what, what safeguards need to be in place with respect to your access to the data to ensure accountability for its use. Th those are the conversations that the ICANN community with respect to the domain name WHOIS database are attempting to have now um, and uh, to, to build essentially a matrix of the sort of who needs access to uh, what data, under what circumstances, for what purposes, with what safeguards in place. That's the matrix that has to be built out. Um, and then how do you know that the person is um, the, is a cert? How do you know that the person is those things? Those, those, that's the work that the community has to do. It is, um, I know, frustratingly difficult and slow. Um, but if we all wrapped our heads around the notion on the one hand, you know, fully published on the internet, public who is, is not really not a reality in a post-GDPR world, um, to uh, using this information to resolve disputes about the use of domain names um, is a legitimate purpose. Now what are the safeguards that you need to put in place? And that's the process we uh, are trying to facilitate. So I'm, I'm mindful of time, so I want to give um, maybe one more intervention from the floor, and then as I promised at the outset, I want to reserve time. Um, I know Greg and Paul have both wanted to get in, and I'd ask if you want to, you, you know, um, you can fold in your, your comments along with, but make sure you give us that one key takeaway that I asked from, from each person. But I, I see one, one comment from the floor. Yes, there. Yes, hello. My name is Laurie Schulman. I'm from the International Trademark Association. So, of course, we have a deep interest in the contactability of information on the web with regard to registration of domain names. Um, INTA is part of the intellectual property constituency at ICANN, who is part of the expedited policy development process. Today, though, I intervene on behalf of uh, INTA itself, the International Trademark Association. I'm not speaking on behalf of the IPC. And I would say that I would agree with my colleague, I don't know her on the other side of the room, that talked about if you were going to talk about um, whether or not you have full access or no access, absolutely I agree with Becky Burr that the days of open access probably are over, at least in the current GDPR context. Perhaps there may be other legislative efforts somewhere along the line that may, may create some issues around where to open and when to open in different, different jurisdictions. But today, we're living with GDPR. That being said, I, I think there are many of my members, trademark owners, that would agree that we at least need a minimum of one point of contact information, and that would be the domain address, the, I'm sorry, the email address itself. That having a contactable, accurate, live email address would solve a lot of the issues that my members are having with enforcement. And, and I agree with Varzanay. There's a lot of sensitive information inside the WHOIS database, and there are a lot of small business owners and, and families and, and then people who register who don't necessarily expect to be contacted by five or six or seven different um, internet service providers for web, websites and SEO and so on and so forth. So, so we can certainly respect that. But at the same time, what we're finding is we have a lot of members that have a lot of affiliates. They have fan sites. They have um, chapters. And what's happening now, and particularly with NGOs, and we have this by way of an example, we have a, a member of a worldwide NGO that doesn't know who to contact. They, don't, they can't figure out if sites are legitimately authorized or not because they can't even reach out to ask a question. And when they attempt to do so, um, to register as a registry, it will file, file an action, file a subpoena, you know, give us a legal basis beyond your say-so um, to, to reach out for this information, when in fact, if a simple contact request could be made and something found out quickly and efficiently, it could avoid a lot of litigation, it could avoid a lot of misunderstandings. And at the same time, it would put others on notice that there is an issue. You know, let's say it's not a friendly act or a friendly site, then at least they're on notice that something might be coming down the pike. Yep. So I would certainly offer by way of a practical solution that the publication of an email address be, be very seriously considered when people are talking about how to advocate for implementation. And not necessarily inside of ICANN, but also outside of ICANN. I think there is some um, over-reliance on what ICANN actually can and cannot do in this space, and if there was more advocacy with the DPAs from the private sector outside of ICANN, it could actually be helpful to ICANN. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thanks very much. And I think you, you raised also this um, additional element, which is not just, as, as Christine pointed out, access or no access, but also, as, as Greg highlighted, uh, law enforcement does have access, but then it becomes about this, the timeliness of, of the access. But I think, Duncan, we need to, uh, we need to move on, don't we? Yeah, so I, I think, um, as promised at the outset, we were looking to come away with um, at least a, a tentative list of concrete either questions or statements that might be um, for progressive development, because I think one of the things that comes out of this conversation is we're not necessarily in a great place, and we need to figure out a way to get forward. And so um, maybe I'll start with you, Paul, to, 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 to ra help wrap us up, and we'll do, yeah. gonna have to be quick, though, as we, as we work through. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of awareness of ICANN that we've seen here in this room, and, uh, and I think an assumption that ICANN is where it all happens. Um, but the ICANN policy processes that happen at ICANN meetings, uh, they pertain to the number registry, to the name registries. The RIRs, the five different RIRs, have each got a set of policy development processes which are similar to, um, different from each other and different from ICANN's. And so if there are going to be any changes or if anyone is seeking changes to the way any of the RIRs are conducting our work in maintaining and managing our registry databases, then it's through those regional processes that you can come. And we do, we do have participation in different RARs by, by representatives of security and law enforcement communities who are, who are very interested in making sure that, uh, that the database, to the extent that we can, is fulfilling their, their, um, their interests. So that's how the system works. It's not all about ICANN. Um, in the number space, it's about the RARs. And so that's an open in invitation to anyone who's really got an interest in this area to, to look at how the RARs are, are dealing with IP address management and registration in your, uh, in your region. Thank you. I know, Greg, you've been wanting to weigh in, so I'll, I'll turn to you next. Thank you, Duncan. Um, to conclude, really, what I wanted to say is I do agree with Fazi and many other um, uh, speakers that uh, um, we can't go back to a HUI system pre-GDPR, and that's not what the law enforcement community is after. Actually, I think that uh, what we're going through now um, is a very exciting time. We need to devise a modern system of due process that can scale globally, um, include the right checks and balances, proportionality, transparency. We need to find the right balance between anonymity, which is absolutely critical for safety, but on the other hand, in a rule of law-based democracy, the right to privacy is not absolute and we need to find the right balance and, and, and balance it against the right of victims. And I think that we are, we are going to be successful. It will take time, it's painful, it's, uh, but, but it's also super exciting and I'm, I'm very hopeful that we will manage to define clearly who are the actors, what are their interests, what type of information they should have access to, what should be the, the safeguard, etc. cetera. And, um, and re yes, I'm hopeful that we will manage to, to find that system. Okay, thank you, and we're on, we're on, we're on the two-minute mark. So, um, Chris, I'm going to give you, then Farzi, uh, and then Becky. Thank you. Um, one of the things uh, I would like to say is that uh, people should consider what is best. Is this to have an email that's public or to have the risk of creating a market of organizations that will sell access to who is? And I already heard of some managed service providers that want to create this as a service. I will, I will charge to provide access to all data. And this is much less controllable than having the registries, having the email public, and that serving uh, a broader community. But if the move goes for tiered access, uh, especially for the CERT community, it's not true that nobody knows who is a CERT. We at least have several communities that have very well-established membership processes. First is one of the communities. I'm the co-chair of the membership committee. I could try to help explain that. But we have AP CERT in Asia. We have First Japan in Japan. We have Latin America moving to adopt their the TI introducer. And I would say that the TI uh, accredited, and especially the... Um, uh, the, the other name that is certified teams, they would qualify very good. Uh, Farzan is speaking. Uh, so, you ask me for a solution. That's really difficult. Um, <laughs> or, or a but question. You can you can you can pose. I think you know some. Que what's the question that we should be answering? So I just. I just think that I just have a message. I think we should not have waited for GDPR to talk about this. It is very um, upsetting to <laughs> advocates for privacy. And GDPR should not have been a uh, reason, not a law. In a multi-stakeholder community where we are working on 
uh, operation of the internet as well as respecting rights on the internet, we should have thought about the privacy of uh, the registrants, either uh, IP or uh, domain names. And we should continue this discussion. And I do not have, uh, I think, the access to this data for the legitimate interest uh, as long as it, it is with uh, safeguard. Uh, I think that is appropriate, but I, I have to add many more conditions. <laughs> so that's what, that was my message. Thank you. Becky? Um, well, I'm going to try and be uh, practical. I, I like the conversation about what I really need. If I'm a cert, I need an email address. What I, you know, I, as an IP address, uh, IP owner, what I need most of all is the um, is the I is the email address. I think um, as we move towards solving a, this problem, I think the only way that we actually really solve it, and I don't, and it doesn't really matter to me, sort of what regime we're in. Um, what we need is the matrix that says who has access to what information, under what circumstances, with what safeguard, for what purpose. And the more people can articulate the, I really need the email address, um, or whatever, the faster we are going to get to a, a solution that tries to address those concerns. Thank you, Becky. Thank you. So thank you to everyone who's participated in this today. And, and I think when we're thinking about these questions of accountability, um, it, it's a, exactly as you just said, Becky, accountability for, for anyone accessing data and using data. And, and as Farzana pointed out, we shouldn't have waited 25 years to, to finally have a, in my view anyway, to, to get to a point where we actually uh, insist on, on, on these kind of safeguards. But I think we've come away with a few really concrete, interesting, uh, useful uh, points, one of which is this uh, granularity of, of access and really expressing stakeholders' needs in a very specific way. And the other is the, the question of timeliness. Um, now, we'll, we'll be writing all this up into a, a report, as is the practice here at the IGF, and, and, uh, and we'll publish it online and, and disseminate it. And, and hopefully this is, um, yeah, this is the first of, of many conversations that we can have about how to deal with these kind of issues that appear to be in conflict, but actually when we, we dig into them, uh, we find that there, there are paths forward. So thank you very much. Thank you to, to my, my uh, co-conspirators, Duncan, Paul, and of course, Pablo, who, who's not here today, and, and to all our speakers and, and everyone who participated.